Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what's wrong with open source, and I hope to be agreeable, even though I'm going to disagree with perhaps some of the things that you've held dear and true. Uh, if you feel a little beat up after this, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that you can use what I'd like to present here today to maybe make a difference, because that's really why I'm, I'm presenting this. So <clears throat> first of all, what is open source? Who wants to give me a definition of open source? Go ahead. It's where the source code is publicly available for an application. OK. Anyone else want to give a try? I'm guessing that means it's Yes. And is licensed in a particular way. OK. It enables you to use it for really uh, certain undesirable consequences. OK. Anyone else? All right, Wiki. Yeah, you might want to check out opensoftware.org. They have a list of all the things that make you qualify as open source. And some of those ideas might be vaguely represented in there. But I was a little surprised reading through that, and I think you might be as well. One of the problems that we have in the open source community is defining what open source even is. If we don't know what it is, and we can't agree on that, we all have a little bit of a different idea of what open source is. Uh, you want to be able to look at the source, that's great. But licensing is a big part of that. And if you're not thinking about that, then you're not technically classified as open source by the people who are the purists. And uh, it kind of inhibits the movement, I would say. Then, what is free software? How about that one? Anyone want to venture a guess on that? It's ones they don't have to pay for. Ones you don't have to pay for? Free as in beer or free as in speech? Great questions. Uh, Richard Stallman. Uh, we're going to talk about four freedoms, not the Roosevelt four freedoms, but the Stallman four freedoms. Um, yeah, so free software. We all use free and open source software when we talk about FOSS and free and open source software. But do we really know what free software is? That's kind of a challenge for us. Um, let's talk about those four freedoms. The freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. That's a great freedom. And I really like it, but that's a challenge. The freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish, and access to the source code is a precondition for this, which is what you were talking about. You have to be able to see the source code for it to be open source. Well, you have to have the freedom to look at the source. Uh, if you don't have that freedom, I don't think it qualifies as open source. Uh, you have to have the freedom to redistribute copies to help your neighbor or potentially your enemy, I guess. Um, the, the freedom to redistribute is part of the licensing that, that Scott was talking about, and also the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. By doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit. And that's great, but you also need the source code access to do that. Uh, and that's because you need the source code to actually modify it at all. Uh, and then in addition to that, you also need licensing ability to be able to say, I made a derivative work and I can still distribute it. Um, so when you're working in open source, what kinds of things motivate you? I believe that the motivations for participating in open source software falls into these four categories. First of all, entertainment. How many of you like to write open source software for fun? A couple of you huge nerds. OK, that's great. Uh, how many of you do it because you get paid to do it? A couple of you. Yeah, that's kind of important. You like to eat and things like that. Uh, how many of you did it because you found a problem that you had personally and you wanted to solve it? Wow, I expected way more hands. Yeah, <laughs> Open source is kind of a personal problem. Uh, and then the societal problems. How many of you do it for like activism kinds of things or to help out the community, Code for America, those kinds of things? All great causes, I would say, depending on what your motivation is for the societal problem. Uh, but uh, those are, I think, the motivations for joining this open source software movement and the reasons why we choose to do that. Uh, perhaps you may have heard this quote, every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's personal itch. How many of you believe that? I do. Okay. I disagree. I think every good piece of software that a developer came up with may have started with a developer's personal itch. But not necessarily all good pieces of software come because of the idea of, an, of a developer, right? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you're not the only smart people in the world. 
it's possible that there are other smart people out there who have great ideas too, and that doesn't make it a bad idea, and it doesn't mean that it can't turn into a gr good work of software or a great piece of software because a designer came up with it, or a childcare specialist came up with it, or a trash can receptacle retrieving specialist came up with it. Uh, it doesn't matter. What's that? Or worse yet, sales. Or a salesperson. Maybe a salesperson came up with this great idea. Or an attorney came up with this great idea. We're going a little too far now. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we have, but, but the point is, your personal itch isn't the only thing that makes good software. If you think that's true, I challenge you to think a little deeper. Uh, now I want to talk about a couple of notable open source projects. How many of you see something you love on this list? I hope you do. How many of you see something you use every day on this list? If you don't raise your hand right now, you're a liar. Um, <clears throat> Alright, so first one I want to talk about is Linux. Linux has a large community. And the problem that Linux has that I think is the biggest problem they have, unskilled users have a really hard time using it. Uh, we have some vendors here who are selling uh, what they've made is the, like, the easy version of Linux, and they say that it's so much easier than Windows. Uh, I would say that the barrier to entry and the number of people using Linux would disagree with that sentiment. Uh, it is hard to use Linux in a lot of ways for a lot of people. Now, that doesn't mean that Linux is a terrible piece of software. It has challenges, just like any other piece of software. But being able to get unskilled people to use your software when you want them to use it is a problem for Linux. And there are a lot of people who are working on that. Uh, another part of the problem with Linux is reused ideas. Yes? Do you think that, um, so I come from the BSD background, so I'm clearly a bigot. Um, <laughs> I'm with it's you. a very tiny you know, community. Um, I, when, when I saw unskilled users problem, I instantly thought, oh, it's because there are so many unskilled coders working on Linux. I mean, I know a lot of them are really excellent. Right, BSD borrows liberally from Linux all the time, but Linux is the first to get all the worst ideas, <laughs> vet them, and throw them away. And so I, I'm wondering if you if you believe that the large community and the end user problem are related. Uh, there, there certainly is the possibility of that, and I'm not here to tell anyone who in this room might be a developer in the Linux community, which good for you. I think you probably should uh, that you're stupid or you're unskilled. Uh, no, I think I, that I wasn't implying that. I'm just saying that there's such a large group. I, I think that there. On average, when you have a huge group of contributors, a, per, a, a percentage of those are going to be really bad. And a sure, and really good. Right, and you hope that the percentage of people who are really good can make up for those really bad people, right. or maybe mentor them so that everyone lifts up. That's great. Uh, I, I think that that's definitely a possibility, and I'm, I'm sure that those kinds of effects are in a lot of different kinds of open source software because of the way that the community works, because of the. Uh, a lot of the communities for open source software, including Linux, are volunteer-based. How many of you work on a volunteer-based community for open source? A bunch of you, right? Uh, how many of you are the smartest person in that group? Okay. If it's a group of one, maybe you are, right? You're also the, the least intelligent person in that group, so good for you. Um, that, that's kind of a challenge. And then as far as reused ideas, you talk about BSD and, and things like that. Well. Uh, Linux and its lack of innovation, how many things are unique to Linux that weren't, say, part of Unix before that? I don't know. It's, it's, what, what kinds of things are unique to Linux that weren't part of Unix before that? I mean, Linux is birthed from Unix, right? It, it came from all the great ideas that were in, Linux, in Unix. And Unix was not an open source project. It was corporate funded, right? But uh, a lot of the things that were in that were used to create Linux and all the great things that it has. What are the new innovations in Linux? Recognizing USB when it's plugged in, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and is that really a, a Linux thing or is that just something that they stole from Windows and Apple and whatever? I mean, the, there, there is, I think, a dearth of innovation because of some of the way that this community works. And we think, oh, well, we're great developers, but we don't think about how are we moving this to the future? And then the last one I want to talk about for Linux is fragmentation. There are so many different flavors and distros of Linux that to some degree we're tempering our ability as an open source community to make things better because we've created a million different paths for us to use Linux. You've got you know, Ubuntu and Fedora and Red Hat and 
whatever others. All, all, the, all the other ones. I mean, I, I don't know that I've named your favorite one, and if I didn't, I'm so sorry. Uh, if I did, I'm also so sorry. Uh, but, but all of those things are branches of the same software. And within the open source community and the large community that is behind Linux, you will have zealots who are, will say, you know, the best thing that you can do is contribute only to Red Hat. The, it, it absolutely is true. You'll, the Red Hat is the best, and I don't care about the OpenSUSE people because their stuff is terrible, and who cares about them, right? Uh, and they may not say it in those words, but what they're saying is, I have chosen the battle that I would like to do, and I don't care about anybody else. And that's not very open source software to me. That sounds like just a, a niche community where you're fighting against someone else as if they were an enemy. Uh, next, I want to talk about Apache one of my favorite open source projects. It has a high degree of stability and a very strong community and a very low defect density, um, which I guess we'll talk about later when we talk about projects with very high defect densities. But there are not a lot of critical bugs in Apache. Uh, their, their process is managed very well. With that being said, does Apache still have problems? Yes. Do they have critical vulnerabilities? Yes. Do they have software dependency problems with other things? Absolutely. Uh, I think that Apache does a great job of managing not only their, uh, their web server, but a lot of other projects that they're working on. And that's why they're a highly successful and well-respected open source group. So I think that in a lot of ways, we want to try and mirror the communities that we're working in after things like Apache and Linux. Because they do such a great job of getting their communities together and making things better. Uh, now I'd like to talk about some communities that are a little bit less advanced. Uh, how many of you have heard of OpenSSL? <laughs> All right. You better have heard of OpenSSL because it is everywhere. And it is critical for the internet. But there is one full-time developer working on that project. Or at least up until about the time of Heartbleed, there was one full-time developer working on that. Does that scare anyone? That scares me. The thing that's keeping me secure is worked on by one guy. And uh, there is a lot of code in that code base. And he ain't making much money either. And he, he's probably not being paid very much. Uh, and then you have something like Heartbleed. And as soon as Heartbleed comes out, the accusations start flying, right? They say, well, why didn't you fix this? And the developer, of course, says, well, I am one person. How in the world could I see you know, 40,000 lines of code simultaneously and just know where the Heartbleed vulnerability is? And so he says, well, why doesn't the community get more involved? Why don't we have someone pay for more developers? Or why don't we have more people join in? Why don't we get someone to fund some kind of audit for this? And a lot of those things actually got started because of Heartbleed. But the question is, do you want your project to get to the point of Heartbleed before you try and make that growth spurt? I'm not sure that that's the right thing to do. If you can avoid it, you probably should because Heartbleed was really painful. Yes? Uh, I'm not. Oh, so, great example of some people have just noticed since then is New PG. One developer, he was making like 40000 a year. That's it. One guy knows the code base. And I really have a lot of critical stuff stored with GPG, and I care about it a lot. So, but how do we get the same attention to New PG that we got to open SSL without Heartbleed? You know, without the painful. Yeah, how do we get there without the pain? And you have situations like, what happens if that person decides to take a hiatus? They decide to go surfing in New Zealand for a while. Or they get into a coma, unfortunately. Like, what happens to GPG if that one developer is gone? For any reason. Aliens abduct him. Whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter what happens. If he's gone, who's running that project? No one. Uh, you want to make sure that your project is not... A, a one-man army or a one-woman army. You don't want that to happen to your project or you'll suffer the same kind of fate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Node. How many of you are friends with Node? Love Node? I love Node. Uh, a great deal of very high-level developers in the Node project decided the, the joint people are exercising some kind of totalitarianism. They're controlling everything. And so they decide, well, let's just fork that. We'll create io.js. 
Is that a great idea? Well, yeah, because open source software can do that, and it's open source. But now you just divided the community in half. And then people wonder, should I go to Node? Should I go to io.js? Do I wait for io.js to catch up? Or you know, where, where do I make that call? And why can't you just work it out? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of those developers, and I don't understand how the, the process works inside of that. But if you have some individuals who are active contributors to your project who are feeling some dissatisfaction, and are feeling like maybe the only thing that they can do to salvage what work they put into the project is to fork it, maybe you should have a, a thorough discussion on how to resolve that in a better way if you can. All right, how many of you heard of TrueCrypt? I'm a, well, I guess I was a big fan. Uh, licensing issues plagued TrueCrypt, and TrueCrypt was an open source project by the way that the developers decided to name it, but a lot of people were very concerned about the licensing that they wrote for themselves and had deemed it that it was not open source because of some of the licensing restrictions. And this is where open source gets really fuzzy. How do I know if it's open source? And then you have a hidden development group of a bunch of people who nobody knows who are trying to say, you know, secret because of what they're working on. I guess that's probably a good thing. But what happens if those people go away? Well, they did. They abandoned the project. They said, I'm sorry, we're done. There are unfixed vulnerabilities in this. You should never use it again. <laughs> and for something as, as important as that, you know, you want to be able to audit that and determine that. So someone uh, decided wisely to create a crowdfunding, you know, Kickstarter type of thing to fund an audit for security of TrueCrypt. And they did that just in time for the TrueCrypt people to rage quit and leave. Uh, that's great, except for what do you do now? So the people who funded the audit spent all their money. You know, the auditing people started the work. They actually decided to continue finishing the work. They came up with a couple of things that were probably in need of some repair. But it didn't matter because none of those people will continue to work on it. Uh, that's, that's a problem for your open source thing, if that's what happens. Uh, I think that if you need some funding to do something like auditing, maybe you should do that uh, in advance so that you don't have to have that kind of a, an environment where you just need to quit. And uh, also, avoiding project abandonment by really important people is a big deal. Uh, you need to make sure that if your project depends on certain people that you get them engaged or you get them replaced. All right, uh, another one that I really love that maybe isn't used as much as some of those others, FFmpeg. How many have used FFmpeg? Okay, a lot of you. Uh, it's a powerful tool. It is everywhere, but it is kind of hard to use, right? You have to like look at, through the man pages or Google forever to find that one guy who figured out the one switch that does the one thing that you want. And so you have a bunch of these like gap filling applications that spring up on SourceForge of I figured out how to make this GUI to do FFmpeg on this one thing. How many of you have seen like 10 of those, right? A lot of you. There's just a ton of them. And the question is, is that really what you want to do with your project? Uh, if you're a developer and you understand how to write a command line application and people who are trying to use your application don't understand how to use command line applications, maybe you should think about the direction that you'd like to take your application in or figure out who can help you to get it to those other users that you would like it to reach. Um, for those of you who are fans of XKCD, making your program or your product easy to use is kind of important. Uh, I don't know how many of you can pass the tar test, but uh, a lot of people can't. It is really hard to be able to use something. And how many of you use tar on a regular basis, maybe even every day at your job, right? You use tar a lot. But man, when you have to do that one thing that you haven't done in three weeks or something, good luck. You are Googling or you know, searching through the man pages. What was the word that they used to, to call this thing that I'm trying to do? Yeah, is it a capital R or a lowercase r or whatever? And it takes you a while to figure that out. And if you have 10 seconds or whatever, if you have like an hour to solve this problem and you're trying to write this thing and whatever, how do, you, how do you solve that? Well, the solution is you should probably just write better software or cleaner documentation. <clears throat> All right. Now we're going to talk about bug density. Um, how many of you are fans of XM? You use XM? Uh, there was a talk given it. Okay, two different questions, that's very true. Um, XM has an enormous popularity, pretty large community. 
there was a talk recently given at DEF CON talking about the, the bug density. In the 3,500 lines of code, there are 13,401 critical bugs. Does that scare anyone else? That's an off-the-charts outlier for all the things that they studied in, in preparing for that talk. Yes? Out of curiosity, what uh, coding convention do they use? GNU's? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. No. So I'm reporting on someone else's research. I did not actually look into the source code of Exum myself. Um, but, but with that being said, it, it stands to reason that the, the defects or the bugs that are in software inherently, because we're imperfect humans writing software applications for machines that are far more effective at doing perfect things than we are, that there are going to be bugs. And the question is, how do you handle that? If you don't have a process for handling that, well, you might end up with 13,000 critical bugs and 35,000 lines of code, which is really scary. Um, if you have you know, 100 lines of code and you end up with one critical bug, that's probably equally very scary. Uh, you need to know what your software is doing and planning to make sure that you have that kind of uh, a check in place is important. Uh, and it takes work. Uh, a lot of times as developers, we're scratching that itch, we're doing the thing that we want to do, and we don't think about some of the consequences of what we're actually doing, and we don't think, how can I make sure that this is kind of durable or that it works in other sorts of scenarios. Uh, all right, the last one I want to talk about, LibreOffice, OpenOffice. How many use this? A couple of you, probably because your company doesn't want to pay for software or something like that. Um, it's an open source alternative to some great software packages, and it has some really growing communities. But the, the problem is that these things were created as open source projects to compete with things like Microsoft Office. And when you measure these things up against things like Microsoft Office, where they've got a whole lot of head start, that it's missing some features. And when you try and switch, it's not very easy. Uh, I remember the first time that I trade LibreOffice, and I was trying to pull my Excel spreadsheet from one place into another, and the columns were all messed up. And I tried as hard as I could to fix it, and I said, Forget it. I'm leaving your computer here and your terrible software here, and I'm going to go home and use Microsoft Office because it just works. Uh, if your software has that kind of a path where you'd like people to migrate from proprietary software to your open source software, you need to have some kind of transition to get them in there, and it needs to be a good one. And you need to make sure that you're not forgetting the features that people use. If you say, oh, well, I've got 90% of the features, you know, is 90% good enough for you? It's not good enough for me. <laughs> there was some spreadsheet bug that, that like a large population of corporate America uses to calculate some certain formula, and Microsoft Excel, Excel does it uh, awesome. Uh, open Office Calc. No, we're never going to make that work. Yeah. Uh, how would you feel if the developer of your project said, we're never going to make that work? <laughs> would, you, would that make you want to use that piece of software? The answer is no, in case you were wondering. You would not want to use that piece of software. Thank you for the clarity. Glad I could help you out there, Russell. So what is Bluehost using currently? You guys use Word? Uh, we use probably all of those things. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's more of an individual kind of thing and a needs-based thing. And a lot of people at Bluehost actually don't use any of those because they don't have any need for that. But that's a different story entirely. All right, so uh, talk a little bit about fallacies. I'm going to tell you my fallacy right now. This is an observation fallacy. Uh, I'm talking about the problems that I see in open source with the things that I have seen. And I've mentioned a couple of them here. And you say, well, Seth, you don't know about my project and how great it is. And the answer is, yes, I have no idea about your project and how great it is. But the same thing applies to the way that you think about open source. If you think open source is so great and all open source is wonderful and it has been touched by the hand of Richard Stallman and now it's beautiful and it can never be bad, you must be looking at the wrong projects. Okay, because there are a lot of terrible open source projects out there. Uh, we as humans tend to, to have this fallacy where we look at the things that we care about and we make a judgment based on just those things. You know, you, you make a judgment uh, in the morning and you say, you know, my kid ran away to the bus stop a little bit early and I didn't know he was there, so I must be a terrible parent based on the one data point of this morning. You know, is that a good data point to make a judgment on? No, of course it isn't. And a lot of times, we don't think about the way that we're making these kinds of judgments. We just say, oh, someone told me that open source is great, and I know that I use Red Hat, and Red Hat is perfect for me, so all open source is good. Uh, that's a little bit of a logical jump, everyone. So please be careful with that. 
So how do we solve the problem of open, of open source? There are, I mean, open source is a, a fantastic idea, but it has some problems. So I think the first thing is it starts with you. You need to be involved, and instead of taking a, you know, the side path of, well, someone will do it, or I'm just going to use this software because it's free, then maybe you, know, you can make a change and you can make a difference in the community. So first of all, freedom isn't free. Uh, thanks to all the veterans and those who have you know, kept our country safe. But uh, freedom, as far as software, also isn't free. How do you pay for the cost of software? Software costs to develop. Uh, some of you who are hobbyists probably use your spare time for that, right? That's a cost that you pay when you develop software. Is that great? Maybe, if you're willing to give it. But what happens if the guy who does the hobby software decides, ah, you know what, I want to surf instead of write software? Well, the cost is too high now. So who pays for it? And how does it affect other people? If you say, well, you know, in our group, we're going to have everyone will work on this project every Saturday from now until Christmas. You know, you're affecting a bunch of other people in this group. How does that affect them? How does that change their lives? Are you, you know, inhibiting their family life or their political life or their religious life by saying, well, you have to be here on Saturday to do this thing? Um, <clears throat> We tend to use free and open source software because of our greed and our lack of willingness to accept the consequences of what we're trying to do. We say, you know, I'm going to use this because I can just use it. It's free. I can do whatever I want with it. It's open. And there's no obligation for me to do anything to help out with that project. But the moment that something like Heartbleed comes up, I'm going to complain to that dev and say, you didn't do your job. Uh, also, if you're trying to do something like get someone to pay for the cost of the free software that you're developing, you need to come up with some kind of alternate revenue stream. Uh, a lot of people have noticed the thing called in-app purchases. Uh, that's kind of fantastic, or you know, you resell private stuff. But uh, a lot of the, the mantras that are behind open source say that if you have great software that's developed correctly, you shouldn't need a great deal of you know, effective documentation or you shouldn't need support because it should just be able to be used. Well, when you write software that's like that, you eliminate the monetary ability for you to provide support for that project as a service. Uh, how many of you have seen an open source software project where they provide a service to support? MySQL maybe or, you know, Maria or whatever those things are. Uh, a lot of these things, uh, or even Red Hat, uh, the software is free, and you can use the software as much as you want, but the second you have problems, they would like you to come and pay for the support. And that's an interesting model, but if you des develop software where people don't need support, how are you going to pay for that? It's, it's difficult to do that. The next thing you need to talk about is where do you want this to go? Do you have a roadmap, or are you just scratching an itch? Um, do you start developing before you really think about the long-term consequences? Are you just developing for you? If so, why are you open sourcing it at all? If it's just your thing, who cares what you think? Right? That's not open source. That's, hey guys, here's my posting on Twitter or Facebook. or It's made of code, though. Um, <clears throat> and uh, is anyone in your project thinking about the future? Where is your project headed? Do you know where you're headed? Uh, is your release early and often strategy actually killing you because you're like, oh, let's go as fast as we can and release this thing and it'll be so great. And then you realize, oh man, we should have done this other thing. We should have thought about that a little bit more. Uh, or do you just add like the infinite options and configurations? How many of you use Linux and they're like options, right? Wow. You can configure everything. You can XORG your way to something. And there are configurations to, to do just about everything. Uh, how many of you have seen Apple devices where there are almost no configuration options? Right? Does it work for them? Yep. Yes, they make the choice for you. There is kind of a scale on which you need to decide where your project sits. And I'm not going to tell you where it needs to sit, but you should put some serious thought into that before you go too far down the road in your project. Because if you don't, you'll end up on one end of the scale or the other, and you'll be very sad. Uh, the next is what kind of community do you want? Who do you want to be involved in your project? Uh, 
Uh, and how do you get those people to be involved in your project? How do you entice them to be part of your project? Um, how are you meeting the needs of the potential users that you want? Are you the only user? Do you think you're the only user? Do you want to be the only user? Uh, and if so, why is it open source? Uh, are you building a product that competes with something else? For example, I want to build LibreOffice to compete with Microsoft Office. Okay, well, how do you get your people to transition? If you're building that kind of open source project and you haven't thought about that, your project will be a failure. Or you'll have to scrap it and start over again, which I guess is a failure. Uh, how are you identifying the needs that your users have? Do you just think that you know what they're like? Uh, I think a lot of the problems with things like LibreOffice and OpenOffice is you have a bunch of developers who are really smart coders who have never used Excel like an accountant. Right? If you think you know what it's like to be an accountant, you're wrong. Uh, if you think you know what it's like to be a marketing specialist, you're probably wrong. Uh, those kinds of things, I mean, people spend their lifetimes trying to learn how to be good at their profession, and their profession is not yours. They've lived entirely separate lives from you, and they're okay. They've survived. So it's conceivable that they don't think exactly like you, and that if you spend some time trying to figure out how they use that, then you'll probably be better off. A lot of times, we as developers, especially those of us who develop you know, in command line kinds of things, we ne neglect front end things. We don't care how pretty it looks. We just want the software to work because we care about functionality. right? I want my script to be able to do this thing. Oh, how do I use this? Oh, well, you'll have to just look through the code. RTFM. Right? Or RTFM. Uh, also, proper communication and error messaging. How many of you have seen an error message that you knew was written by a developer? Everybody in this room, right? The, the error code 1246, or let me spew, like the memory address of where the problem happened to the user. How many users in the world understand how to read a memory address and how to fix it? Almost nobody, right? Nobody's going to pull out Ida Pro and let me figure out how to fix your code. It's an open source project, and they're just the user. They're they, yes? The one that annoys me the most is the OK button. Your file was just deleted, and you have to click OK. It's like, it's not OK. Give me an the worst is when it has cancel, too. Right, yeah, right. All right, and have you done any user testing? Do you actually test with the users that you expect to have or people who approximate that? Or do you test with your group of peers because they're really smart? Uh, next, what kind of support will you provide? Is the support that you provide, you're on your own? Or is the support that you provide, well, <coughs> patches are welcome, right? Uh, what happens if the person who finds a bug in your stuff doesn't want to contribute to your product or doesn't know the language that you're writing it in? You know, I don't know Erlang, I'm sorry. I know that there's a problem with your thing, but I don't know how to fix it. Oh, well, patches are welcome. Or what if a, a designer says, you know what, you would be much better off if you made this change. How does a designer make a patch in Erlang? It doesn't happen, guys, it just doesn't, okay? Um, you need to be able to understand how to, how to deal with those kinds of scenarios if you'd like your project to be successful. And then how do you respond? How do you get feedback? Uh, a lot of open source projects don't have anything in the readme to say, you should give feedback here. Or in their you know, documentation, there's no way to say, email me to let me know. Or I respond best in Twitter. If you do, tell people. They're much more likely to try and connect with you in the way that you would like if you say, I would like you to communicate with me in this particular manner. If not, then you'll end up with people like me who posts on your GitHub a critical vulnerability saying, your software is broken, I didn't have an email address to send this to, and there was no other way for me to tell you that this is a problem, so I'm zero-daying your software because there's no other way for me to communicate with you. You don't want that to happen to your software project. But does it happen all the time? Yes, it does. And then how do you communicate uh, with your developers? Yes? What happened to you when you did that? Were they, like, were they mad? Were they angry? Which time? Um, yeah, which time? <laughs> uh, most recently, I actually uh, submitted a bug for the Call for Papers uh, open source project that they were using for OpenWest. And I personally did not want to submit a patch because I'm not a real big fan of coding in PHP and looking through someone else's icky code. And you know what? It's an open source project, and that's great, but what if I don't want to contribute to it? So I put up some stuff and said, hey, 
there's no other way for me to communicate with you, but you have this bug in your software, and I exploited it actively on the OpenWest thing, and you should probably know that that should be fixed. And actually, another member of the community jumped in and patched it. So it, it worked, but at the same time, how many people are using that software before it was patched? Because you've got your open source thing that you know, is already installed for OpenWest, and do you think Steve updated it? I doubt it. Not between the time when he installed it and uh, certainly not by the time I exploited it, but probably not by now either. So does that answer your question? Yes. All right, uh, moving on. How do you communicate with your group of developers? Uh, how many of you have a geographic challenge in your group of users that are you know, putting things together? You have people who are all over the world because the internet is so awesome and open source will save you, you'll just communicate by email. Right? How many of you think communication by email is a great idea? There's a couple of people like halfway raising your hands. Okay, guys, that's not what I'm talking about here. How many of you think that communication through IRC is a great idea? I'm going to raise my hand down because I think that's a terrible idea. Um, <clears throat> uh, phone calls, maybe that works for you. Or maybe, you know, video chat. Uh, you have to figure out how that works for you, and maybe those things work really well in your community. Uh, I work with the Utah Saint group, and a lot of people there love IRC. I hate it. I'm sorry. I think it's terrible. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily matter. If the people in your group use IRC very well, then you should totally use IRC. <coughs> if you have critical members of your team who don't know how to use IRC or don't want to use IRC, and they never log in, are you going to communicate very well with them? Not if you're using IRC, you won't. Just send them an email. And you can send them an email. Um, and also, can you identify the challenges with the communication that you're having? Do you just assume, we've chosen email and email works? Have you ever you know, asked people, is this working for you? Or do you expect people to be as loud and vocal as I am and say, IRC sucks and I hate it forever? Uh, not many people in the development community are as obnoxious as I am. So <laughs> thankfully, oh, there's Jace too. So. There's Jace too. Uh, but you shouldn't count on that personality characteristic being the thing that saves you. You should think about that. And then do you think that GitHub or Jira or Bugzilla will save you? If you do, or do you implicitly think that they will save you? Uh, if you do, you might be wrong. Uh, next, focus on priorities. How many of your open source projects focus on at least this many things? <laughs> if you're raising your hand, you're a liar. Um, <laughs> if you have both stability and performance on the list, you're doing great. If you're like, oh, you know what, I will totally add that functionality for you. You're doing fantastic. Uh, if you're putting compliance into your project, you're probably regulated for some reason, like for legal reasons, we're being compliant. Uh, or a sadist, yeah. <laughs> and then as far as like usability, if you're trying to make it easier for blind people to use your thing, no, you're not, I'm sorry, you're just not. And security? Well, I mean, we've got OpenSSL, and they've got the Heartbleed thing, and they're doing a great job, but holy cow, it is hard to put that on your roadmap. And unless someone is actively auditing your software, security is probably not a big priority at all. So uh, I guess the, the idea is you can pick two of fast, good, or cheap, and we generally don't do good in open source software, in case you were wondering. Uh, so uh, next, how do you endure? How do you make your software better? so that it can last. What happens if a project member leaves? What do you do? What happens if the project leader is leaving? I'd like to surf in California. I don't care about your open source thing anymore. What do you do? Uh, you know, hopefully, it's kind of a graceful transition where they're willing to hand it off to someone, but shoot, if it's not and you don't have someone to pick up the slack, you're in really big trouble. Uh, what happens when you need someone to leave? What if someone's caustic and you have to kick him out? What if they're the guy in the locker room that you know, is causing all the problems? Do you solve that problem or do you just let it fester? Uh, do you have a policy in your group on how to handle that? And then how do you keep your project from infinite forking? How do you not become Node.io.js the, the next? right? How do you make sure that people don't get mad and just say, well, it's open source, I can do whatever I want? All right, and then uh, how do you balance the individual versus group? Do you have individual accomplishments and challenges that are overcome by individuals running the entire thing? Or do you have a totalitarian, 
that thing, a dictatorship running your project where this one person runs everything and you don't get to choose and you stifle creativity. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a balance to be struck or sometimes uh, you know, it's the right thing to do to have just individuals contributing weird things and hope that it all turns out if you're really good people and you work well together, maybe that works. Or maybe you need the benevolent or not so benevolent dictator to help you get your project out. Uh, next, are you innovating? Are you just forking or stealing? Are you saying, oh, well, Linux is going to be great because Unix was great and it's Unix-like. We just updated it. Uh, or let's make it like Apple. I saw this one thing on, you know, I, I bought an iPhone and iPhones are really cool, so let's make another phone like an Android. Uh, that's not terribly creative. That's not innovation. That's using the same idea that someone already had. And while all of those projects are great, it's not making the world a better place, even though you're still using open source software. Uh, and then lastly, about innovation, hey, maybe let's make it like Facebook, except just this one thing. We're going to make it better in this way. Uh, there's not a whole lot of market viability for competing against Facebook, in case you were wondering. There's just not. Um, there are a lot of open source things out there trying to compete with that, and if you've heard of any of them, you've probably never used them. <laughs> All right, how do you handle maintenance? Do you commit any resources to maintenance, or do you just say, well, we're looking for these new features. We're going to add these new features, and it's going to be great. Who's looking at the code to make sure that you didn't just introduce another bug on top of a bug on top of a bug? Is it anyone in your group doing that? Well, you should probably come up with a plan to handle that. Next, how do you handle defects? Can you respond well and quickly to critical defects? Can you have someone like the one developer in OpenSSL fix Heartbleed and push out a, uh, an update that same day? Hopefully. Um, or can you fix the open call for papers thing that was out there in a very quick time frame? The, the flip side of that is, uh, how do you respond to non-critical things? If someone finds a defect and you're like, oh, well, you know what, that doesn't matter. I'm never going to do the thing that you want. I'm sorry. I just, I don't care. I'm a hobbyist and I'm doing it for me. Uh, that drives people away from your project and removes support for what you're trying to do. Uh, the next thing is licensing an intellectual property. Uh, I know that Richard Solomon thinks that there should be no intellectual property and licensing is all evil and the license that you should use is everyone can use everything and redistribute it and rechange it and whatever and that's part of the open source thing but intellectual property matters and it matters to people who spend their lives trying to make things that they can sell so that they can survive. Uh, your hobbyist project is kind of not as big of a deal as people being able to feed their families. I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Um, so we need to be able to respect that and we also need to be able to use that so that your project doesn't get bitten by some legal problem. That you don't get uh, issues that prevent you from being able to launch your project or to continue to be successful in what you're doing. Uh, the next is who contributes. Do only developers get to contribute to your project? Do you have to know how to use Jira or GitHub to contribute to the project? Uh, if that's the way that you want it to be, Maybe that's okay, but I think you're missing out on a lot of people that can help with that. Do you have too many chiefs or too many cooks or whatever the, the phrase is? You have so many people who are like, oh, let's do this one thing. We'll just add this. Um, or do you care more about politically politicized diversity in your project than you care about making sure your project is good? Do we need more women in our project? Well, that would be great, but do you care more about your project or do you care more about making sure that you have some political equality number to make sure your project is good? Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but I think that if you care more about your project, your project will be better. And at the same time, you shouldn't cut anyone out uh, if they're a qualified or helpful person because of any bias that you might have. <clears throat> Next, how do you manage change? What's the prox process for making a change in direction? If you've created some open source thing and you realize we're going in the wrong direction, do you have a plan in advance to be able to make that change? Or are you just expecting that magically it will fix itself? Uh, we're, as developers, not very good at making those kinds of large-scale changes, and legacy systems are really hard to manage. Uh, how many of you heard of this short story? <laughs> we all kind of think that everybody can do it, and anybody should do it, but they don't, right? Nobody does it, and then everyone gets mad because somebody didn't do it. 
And we all point fingers and say, well, you should have fixed the bug in OpenSSO. You should have fixed the bug in this one thing, or you should have released a better product, or man, I wish FFmpeg weren't terrible to use from the command line, and I had to look through the man pages for 10 minutes while I figure out how to you know, copy this to a different format. Well, that's great, except for what did I do? What did I do to solve that? Did I contribute to FFmpeg? Did I improve the documentation? Did I go look at the documentation? Did I just go post something on their, you know, their forums to say, your software is terrible and I hate you all forever? Uh, you laugh, but people do it, right? And, and we do it. So the question is, how do you make it better? Well, uh, in the end, open source will not save you. Uh, if you believe in the open source movement, that's great. I don't care. Believing in the open source movement does not mean that your project will be great. The thing that's great about your project is the project itself and the people that you have as part of it. You should make a great project be great with the people that you have. You should invite other people to join you as much as you can to make your, your project better. You should think about some of these things and be able to come up with ways to make sure that your project has a plan for the future, that you have clear goals and a clear initiative and a plan for how you're going to handle a number of things that could be uh, you know, pitfalls that you will face in the future. If you have a great project and a great idea and you're scratching that itch, that's not enough. You need to be better at understanding how your project is going to evolve over time to be able to be a great open source project. And that's all I have for you today. Do you have any questions? Let's clap first. Woo! Thanks. Yes. What will save me? <laughs> Being smarter, Russell. <laughs> Yes? Can you name any open source projects that took a hit to quality because they increased the diversity of the team? Can I name any open source projects that have? Um, that's a really good question. No, I'm, 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 I'm not suggesting that at all. And maybe, maybe the way that I phrase that is a little bit misleading. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't try and get different people into your project. I'm suggesting that your first priority should be getting a good project. And it shouldn't matter whether you're trying to get a woman to join your project or a man to join your project or a child to join your project. It should matter, can they help with your project, right? You want people who can help with your project. And that's what I think is important. Now, do I think that all those other things have some great value? Absolutely. And uh, the people that I have worked with on a number of projects, it, it really doesn't matter where they're coming from or what their background is. It matters what they can contribute to the project. If you can contribute to the project, that's what open source is about. Does that help? Sure. So I'm not trying to say that if you have greater diversity in your project that it will be you know, inhibited in some particular way. I'm just saying that if the thing that you're chasing after is diversity over this is what we're trying to do with our project, I think you're facing the wrong direction. You should be able to achieve both goals simultaneously by just doing the right thing instead of saying, well, we need more of this in our project. We need more of our project to actually work in our project. Who can help out? How can we get these people in here? Does that help? Well, yes? It's a similar thing by saying, I want to use these tools, and now I'm going to build something cool. Nobody cares what your tools are. Figure out what you're going to build, and then use the best tools. Right? Like, like I, no one's going to come to your project just because you're built purely on Erlang, right? You don't pick Erlang first and then find a project to match it. Unless you really love Erlang, right? If you are a hobby, but, but then, but then you end up being the one guy who's doing the one thing for your one project, and you're the only one who ever uses it. So yeah, absolutely. Well, certainly, certainly people do, and I worked for a company in the '90s that was a. I won't say their name, but they're a Prolog developer, and they said, we can build mission-critical applications on Prolog, and they failed miserably and went out of business. You know, but but it, they, people do try it, obviously, and they blew millions of dollars in the process. Thankfully, it wasn't a public project, right? <laughs> sure. Well, thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you held up the Apache project as a, you know, an example of how it's done right. 
Uh, what are some of the things that you can think of that uh, are leading? That help it to be done right? No, that, that there's a lot of people who don't use Apache for an XYZ reason. You know, you've got this Nginx, you've got Cherokee, you've got all these other competing products, uh, projects. Why are, why are, why is it still a valid, good example when there's, a, I don't know if there's writing on the wall, but there's the, there's a bunch of different itches being scratched in a similar or the same space. So, uh, I mean, in, in the end, that comes down to competition, right? Just because you have an open source project that's working great for you doesn't mean that someone's going to come along tomorrow and say, I did everything that you did and better. It can happen, and your project needs to be able to evolve in that way. And sometimes what you need to do is include more people in your discussion and figure out, how do I make this better so that I don't get overcome by XYZ project that somebody just baked in their apartment or something. You know, if, if you're not willing to evolve in your project, your open source project is effectively dead, whether you've got people actively committing to it or not. It doesn't matter. You need to be making innovation and change. Yes? Yeah. Well, to that point, I think Apache is a lot more than a web server. It's a governance model and a foundation that allows it to survive from generation to generation of project committers. And I think that's what you're talking about, the importance of having these projects. So you're speaking more to the governance model than the actual product. Well, and the actual product is a great product as well, oh, not the, but not necessarily is it the right product for you, and not necessarily is it the right open source project for you. You'll need to make that call, and uh, if you are part of the Apache group, and you would like to help out with, say, their web server, uh, you should make a lot of changes, and you should you know, do some innovative things. You should contribute to that project, but you should also realize that if Nginx is coming up on your heels, which they are, uh, what are the great things that, are, that they are doing and how do you make it better? And I'm not sure that forking your project into two different versions is the right way to do that, Apache, but you know, maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. Okay. All right, thank you everyone.